We're off again, sailing for months along the coast of South America. Now we're on our way to the Galapagos, an island of dreams made of reason, Darwin's reason, where the foundations for his greatest discovery were laid. This is the place I have most wanted to visit since I was a teenager. Next, I left the clipper briefly to fly to Indonesia in search of the story of Darwin's greatest rival, Alfred Russell Wallace. And I made a journey, the closest you can get to a celestial journey, to find for me the most desirable of all the birds of paradise, the standard wing. On Tahiti, I rejoined the clipper in time for the great crossing of the Pacific Ocean. To sail across the Pacific, you begin to know, to feel, that the planet really is 70% water. In September 2009, I left Plymouth in England to embark on a great adventure. I was invited to set sail with the clipper Stadt Amsterdam and make the same journey that the young naturalist Charles Darwin undertook 179 years ago. The Beagle's circumnavigation of the Earth is the most important journey ever made, far more important than man's voyage to the moon. And I will be repeating this journey together with Darwin's great-great-granddaughter, Sarah. It's a chance of several lifetimes. We're on our way to the Galapagos. When Darwin reached these islands, he'd been on the Beagle expedition for four years and was still driven in his search for the mechanism of evolution. In obeying his admiralty instructions to collect natural history specimens whenever he could, he journeyed closer and closer to two big questions. Where does life come from? And why does it branch into so many different species? the mystery of mysteries indeed. The Galapagos play a crucial role in beginning to resolve these matters. Considering the small size of these islands, we feel the more astonished at the number of their Aboriginal beings and at their confined range. Seeing every height crowned with its crater and the boundaries of most of the lava streams still distinct, we are led to believe that within a period geologically recent, the unbroken ocean was here spread out. Hence, both in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. The Galapagos. Everyone knows it from photographs, from television, but I've never been there. You can count on it that I won't stay on board this time. I want to walk where Darwin walked and see what he saw.
Together with Sarah and a guide, I'm going to explore the islands in the coming days. The Galapagos was, was really the origin of the origin. Together with these discoveries that he made in South America of the fossils of extinct giant mammals, the spatial relationships between the Reyes in, in uh, southern uh, South America, the geographical distribution of the organisms here in the Galapagos, that was what was so key to Darwin, bringing him around to believing in evolution. The Galapagos is an archipelago of islands that despite the fact that they lie close to each other, are all very different. First, we're going to visit the pitch black volcanic island, James Island. The Galapagos Islands are relatively young and are located on a so-called hotspot where tectonic plates move away from each other and where volcanoes create new land. The islands have their own climate and unique vegetation because of the various Pacific Ocean currents which meet here. Hey, wait for me. The old men should not climb mountains. Oh, oh wow, it was worth it. <laughs> Darwin really wished he had a chance to climb to the top of this volcano here. They only had one day here on Isabella, and in that one day, Darwin wrote more on the geology here of this one island than he did on any of the other three islands that he visited. Here we are right now, on one of the youngest islands, this island of Isabella and Fernandina, and that is why this area is where you would expect to see an eruption in Galapagos. So just to remind you, right now we are over the hot spot. Now this hot spot is a stationary convection of heat coming up from the mantle, and we're standing on this plate, it's called the Nazca plate, which is moving in an easter easterly direction towards South America. So, if you imagine my finger, that hot spot, and, the, and the, my hand, the plate moving across, as it moves across, you get islands popping up. We're not the only ones here. Nowadays, the Galapagos Islands are so closely associated with Darwin and the theory of evolution by natural selection that they have become a place of natural history pilgrimage. At first, Darwin failed to notice that closely related species differed from island to island. Who would expect it in such a small place? He saw a lot of extraordinary animals walking around, from birds that couldn't fly to marine iguanas that grazed underwater. But why all these differences? He had no idea. In my walk, I met two very large tortoises. One was eating a cactus and then quietly walked away. The other gave a deep and loud hiss and then drew back his head. They were so heavy, I could scarcely lift them off the ground. They appeared most old fashioned antediluvian animals or rather inhabitants of some other planet.
For the Beagle, the visit to this mysterious island group in the middle of the Pacific was no more than a stopover. For Darwin, the expedition lasted for five years, and of those five years, he spent only a month on the Galapagos. He collected a huge amount of specimens here, but only realized their significance later. I think collecting doesn't necessarily have to have a real meaning behind it or purpose when you start. Yeah. It's just the innate passion for owning things and ordering them and putting them, putting them in their place, which I think is a very human thing. Yeah, so it's a pretty small collection at the Professor moment. Professor must be very fond of you. <laughs> Darwin oh, well, collected thousands, but I've only been got able to... labels and the position, the ship's position at the time. Actually, the date, the time, the time oh. of the day, the date, and the exact position, because otherwise it's meaningless. You have to have that data with each individual specimen um, so that you can, you can know things about the distribution and well, where and when they, they've come from. And Darwin wasn't always... Uh, very good collector at all, was he? I mean, he he forgot to put labels on the pinches from the Galapagos from each different island. And when he got home, he had to rely on Fitzroy's notes. Uh, You're right. He was not uh, not that rigorous. In the same collection where I borrowed this box from, there are there's some of the specimens that Darwin collected on the Beagle and sent home. Uh, and one of them is it's a very nice specimen, well preserved beetle, but it just says. South America on it. Look, that's the only that's information. That's not too good, is it? No, it's not very helpful. But Darwin didn't always know what he was looking for. He, he wasn't focused yet. No, I don't think he wasn't collecting with the specific idea of coming up with this great theory afterwards. He was a genius uh, and extraordinary, but like all of us, he was a product of his time. Uh, geology was really exciting at the time. Why was that? Because the Industrial Revolution, because canals were dug all over the country, and you could see the strata. There it all is. And you can, for the first time, date different piles of sediment by the shells that are in them. And they're the same shells for, for hundreds of miles in every direction. You're getting a grip on time. And then you needed to travel. It's just your home wood and your home river and your home meadows. You're never going to get anywhere near an idea like this. Uh, and so he could do that. The British Navy was, was conquering the seas of all the world. Uh, that was a tremendous opportunity. He could go more or less anywhere he wanted in the world. I think you needed that. You needed a huge amount of experience. And after all, he had five years of it. That's a very long time to think in your cabin. <laughs> when you've seen all this, he had time to digest everything. Until Darwin's time, the notion was accepted that creation, as we saw it all around us, was complete. All animals and humans, all of nature, are fully developed, perfect. But when Darwin, once back home, started inspecting his collection of finches, he was struck by a number of remarkable similarities and differences. We now know that uh, one group of finches came over from uh, South America and, say for example, hypothetically speaking, arrived on this island here. And then what happened at some stage, well they arrived in these islands and they would have adapted, they would have evolved to fit in with the conditions that they found on these islands. And at some stage, a group or one pregnant female flew off to another island where it finds a different set of conditions so it then has to adapt 
to a new type of life and then this one might split off again and fly to this island, finds a new set of conditions and has to adapt and evolve to fit those conditions. And this process can go on, and indeed we think it probably did, and it might be that eventually it hops onto this one, evolves a bit more, and comes back to the first one and meets its ancestor. Darwin found many of the things he saw here very puzzling. These spectacular colours of the birds. Where does all this beauty come from? At first he tries to link it to physical conditions such as warmth and light. But later on, once back at home, and once he starts to think hard about the purpose of beauty, he becomes convinced that this has everything to do with the search for a mate. Evolution by sexual selection, his second great idea. the trickiest part of the trail right here. We hop from one island to the next and scramble about. Something, mind you, that Sarah is far better at than I am. Here in Galapagos, the most striking feature of the geology were the tuff cones. And it was Darwin who came up with the explanation of how these tuff cones form. These things, yeah, and there's, there's a very good example of one right back here, uh, which, uh, and you always see these tuff cones around the coast because you need water. And Darwin came up with this explanation of how you get this interaction of water with the magma, giving rise to a phreatic magmatic explosion. And eventually the ash comes down and compacts. And that's basically what tuff is. Should we have a look? Yeah, let's go have a look. Look at the top there, you have a layer of tuff, That's tough, it's on the top, and then you come down lower, you get the scoria, and then here you have these little lava flows that have formed in, in, uh, in, the, in the scoria. And depending on how much water was in the, the uh, lava, yeah. you would get either a flow or you would get scoria being erupted out. Uh, so, so the lava flows, but the scoria is violently being exploded out. And this, so was what, and this is what was so interesting to Darwin, that you could get these, these example of these sequen sequences of, of first a lava flow, then an explosion of scoria, then another lava flow. So, so Darwin was examining these crystals in the rock. Looking at these crystals, he was able to come up with an animation of how you can get two types of rock coming out of the same vent through gravity settle settling of crystals. Yeah. And this is now known as fractional crystallization. And you can see the layers that he described. He measured the thickness of each of those layers. And uh, he drew a sketch of this in his geological observations. It's astonishing how good a geologist Darwin is. By the time he comes to work out his theory of the formation of coral reefs, he is way ahead even of his master, Charles Lyell. And this man is only 24 years old. Standing in the extreme heat, looking at an inexplicable chaos in the landscape, how did this young man arrive at such geological truths that are still valid today? Eventually, Darwin would pose the theory that all living organisms, even humans, descend from a few forms or one, as he put it in The Origin of Species.
It certainly isn't peaceful on all of the Galapagos. An increasing number of tourists are visiting the islands and that number is now being topped up by the Clipper crew and us. I've dreamt about coming to the Galapagos for years and years, and it is, it's an amazing place. But I think unlike some people, I probably had quite a realistic expectation of what it was gonna be like. I think some people imagine it's gonna be this pristine, unspoiled, no people even. Um, but obviously there are, there are lots of people living here. I mean, this, this is the town, the capital town of Santa Cruz, and there are, there are thousands of people here. Obviously, the thing that everyone knows about the Galapagos is just how tame the animals are here. And it's amazing, you can step right off the boat and there's a marine iguana or a sea lion just, just lying there and you can go up and touch them if you, if you wanted to, you're not really supposed to. In 1950, only 1,346 people lived on the Galapagos. Nowadays, that number has increased to 30,000. The tourists feed the money machine that in turn has to make sure that the natural wonders of Galapagos stay intact. But in order to serve these tourists, an increasing number of people are needed on the island to look after them, to drive them around in cars 24-7. Look at Lonesome George stretching his neck. This is the most famous reptile on earth. He's not active sexually, that's no, what. That's the trouble, right? The main, well, the obstacle, let's put it that way. It's an obstacle. He did react to many Many park guides lead a, troops of tourists point, around. Of time and time again, they patiently explain Darwin's theory of evolution. But they only believe in one truth. The truth of creation as told in Genesis. And Darwin, well, he just ensures there's food on the table. Hace un tiempo atrás, eh, había una situación difícil en mi familia. Eh, mi familia me, me apoyaba a que hiciera el curso de guía. Claro que no fue uno de mis grandes sueños ser guía. Yo creo que las especies pueden ir evolucionando en cierta forma, pero no que, por ejemplo, De una especie muy diferente sale otra totalmente diferente, no. Entonces, cosas así hablaron durante el curso. Y eso como que chocó con lo que yo estaba aprendiendo también en, en, en mi iglesia. Charles Darwin, ¿verdad? La historia del famoso Charles Darwin, eh, muy conocido por la teoría de la evolución, mis amados hermanos. Y otra cosa es que la palabra de Dios nos declara a nosotros que Dios es que existe un creador y que ese creador es el que ha creado todo lo que vemos. Aleluya. La evolución habla sobre ellos, sobre cómo fueron cambiando, ¿verdad? La creación habla sobre el corazón, sobre lo que llena tu alma. Y a mí me gustó más, mucho más, la creación. People spent days on the island working on this meters long wall painting. It represents Genesis, a silent protest against all the adverts for Darwin in the rest of town. Que haya sol, luna y estrella que se paren en el día de la noche. Dios bendijo el séptimo día de la creación. Unfortunately, much has changed on the Galapagos since Darwin's time, but the animals still remain unafraid of us and come within close and friendly reach. Let's hope that this very special miracle will remain a part of these islands forever.
I think the Galapagos, they were known as the Enchanted Islands first by the early navigators and the pirates. And the reason for that was, it looked as if they were moving. And sometimes the clouds would come down and you could never find these specks in the ocean. And then they would appear again. So they were miraculous islands. Well, to me, they're miraculous uh, and utterly enchanted because you can sit with your friends like this. Um, it's enough to make you believe in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And here are all our, um, well, equals. They, they're like domestic animals, but they're wild. Uh, and of course, I've never come across anything like it. You can walk up to seals. Uh, you could, it's just a lovely feeling that you've got friends in the animal kingdom. It's, like, it's the same feeling I get when the dolphins in their, in their hundreds and hundreds come from all around the ocean to the ship to play with the ship. Well, it's much more powerful here. You have to step over these guys, <laughs> it's incredible. I've used to do everything running away from you, from me in, in fear, uh, and that's a horrible feeling. The last day of my visit, I make a short stop at Floriana. In Darwin's time, this was the only island with a permanent population. Darwin came ashore here and visited an Englishman who lived in a settlement that traded tortoise meat. He said that he could tell instantly from which island any particular tortoise came, which Darwin said was a most remarkable fact in the distribution of organic beings. Not long afterwards, he wrote in his notebook that he no longer believed in the stability of species. This thought, he felt, was like confessing to a murder. believe that had the most wonderful time following Charles Darwin and the Beagle. And now I'm off to Indonesia uh, to meet up, as it were, with my other childhood hero, Alfred Russell Wallace, who wrote this magnificent book, The Malay Archipelago. As the clipper leaves for Tahiti, I fly to Indonesia, to the island of Celebes. Because here in Indonesia, something special happened in Darwin's time. So just for this once, I am deviating from the route followed by HMS Beagle to retrace the footsteps of Darwin's rival. Alfred Russell Wallace. He is almost forgotten today. Hardly anybody knows that he is the co-discoverer with Darwin of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Who was Wallace? Why don't we know about him? While Charles Darwin spent most of his life working out his theory and his study, it was here in the interiors of Indonesia where the unknown Wallace came to the same conclusion about the generation of species. I'm on my way to visit Willie Smits. He founded and runs a shelter for animals rescued from poachers and is an expert on Wallace. With him, I look forward to visiting the place where Wallace collected his most spectacular new species of butterfly. But first, he introduces me to one of his friends, a female orangutan. We're saving yeah. these animals, huh? Cool. Trying to do our best. He wants out and he's now very nervous. I have to do yes. something to you now, so you will be trusted. Sorry, I'm not yeah. hitting you. Oh, look. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. So, okay, now it's okay. You can come a bit closer. You have been formally introduced. That's magnificent. <laughs> See, you're welcome now. Very noisy. Oh, Sayang, eh? Sayang, eh? Sayang, eh? 
And you're almost there. A little bit too quick. Wait, wait, go back first. Wait until she invites you. Okay, now that was the sign, her lips. Now you can come forward a little bit. Go get your she, friend. She talked to me. She said, knock it off, you're too old. <laughs> This is it. This is the actual place where Wallace descended into the crater wow. and collected his first beautiful Only butterfly. For a yes, that indeed. Is incredible. I think that's the way to do it. <laughs> so he would climb down here with his net and his various bags and collecting equipment. And it's early morning the best time to look for butterflies. This is a very good time, yes. Yeah. That would be something, eh? To see actually the well, first ridiculous. inspiring species. It would be species. ridiculous. <laughs> huh? You like it? Yeah. <laughs> right oh, oh, here's here. a bird wing. Yes. And it is the one. It is it's the one. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> Amazing. How We actually saw it on the original spot. What a wow. beautiful, beautiful. And we just see it flying by. It just flew from there, yeah. It was flapping and drifting. As Wallace said, one of the most gorgeously coloured butterflies in the world. Willie and I were the only ones who saw it, and it was the only one we saw. Jacko, the cameraman, was too far back to catch it on film. As Wallace himself said, what is the point of all this beauty that no one will see? I have to say goodbye to Willie Smith, but first he takes me to see his favorite crater. I was just eight years away from England, but as I traveled about 14,000 miles within the archipelago and made 60 or 70 separate journeys, each involving some preparation and loss of time, I do not think that more than six years were really occupied in collecting. I find that my eastern collections amounted to 310 specimens of mammals, 100 specimens of reptiles, 8,050 birds, 7,500 shells, 13,100 Lepidoptera, 83,200. Wallace traveled tirelessly from island to island. Each day that he spent in Indonesia brought him closer to the moment when he composed his short letter from the island of Ternate that made a nonsense of the biblical account of Genesis. Although, unlike Darwin, he was unconcerned about the impact his theory of evolution by natural selection would have on religion is one of the most important places in the intellectual history of the world. It was from here that Wallace posted his letter, he sent to Darwin, now known as the Tanati letter, which changed the way we think about everything. The question remains, what did Darwin do when he got the letter from Tanati? he realized that the days of hesitation were over. Darwin knew he had to publish, and fast. Just like Wallace, I wander from island to island. And just like Wallace, we get a warm welcome on every island. It's always wonderful arriving by sea. Two or three of them got round me and begged me for the 20th time to tell them the name of my country. Then, as they could not pronounce it satisfactorily, they insisted that I was deceiving them and that it was a name of my own invention. Anglang, they said. Whoever heard of such a name? Right. Anglang, Anglang, Anglang. 
That can't be the name of your country. You're playing with us. My country is Wanumbai. Anybody can say Wanumbai. I'm an Orang Wanumbai, an inhabitant of Wanumbai. But Anglung, who ever heard of such a name? Here on the island of Halmahira, my dream is supposed to come true. I want to catch a glimpse of the bird of paradise that Wallace discovered here, the Wallace Standard Wing. Wallace had no explanation for the excessively elaborate appearance of the bird, but surprisingly enough, Darwin did. Darwin thought, well, why? Well, first of all, it occurred to him, the question was, why? as um, a bird of paradise, or indeed a peacock. Why have a tail this long? What on earth is that doing? See, in terms of natural selection, this couldn't possibly be produced by natural selection because it makes the bird really heavy, um, an obvious target for a predator, can't fly very fast. What's going on? Um, and then he realized that's part of the point that the girls just love it if a guy is so tough he's carrying around an enormous load that in terms of natural selection really disadvantages him. You know, what a macho guy, what a big guy. Now, they love a long tail and over thousands of generations the girls have selected for a longer and longer tail. Now we know this is the case, it's a very crude and very effective experiment you can do. Then just strap on glue on some extra feathers. And that bird of paradise, when he's displaying with all the other bird of paradise, the girls would go just for him. And at the end of about, uh, well, I think it was three sessions, he killed over and died. <laughs> yes. So that's, there's absolutely no doubt about it. It's sexual selection by female choice. The next day, I enter the jungle. This is as close as I'll ever get to Wallace. Well, it's wonderful to be here. We're 500 meters from the display ground of Wallace's standard wing, Bird of Paradise. Uh, we wait here and then everybody, uh, this half of an army, has to try and stay quiet. And we creep up, all 500 of us, on these five well, it's his standard wings. <laughs> Just like him, I am searching for the bird of paradise with my binoculars at hand, getting sweat filthy, and providing blood for female mosquitoes that are even flying into my ears and up my nose. Just wonderful and exciting too. Wow. Is it? Yes, it's ridiculous. Wonderful display. Keep it up for very long. Eventually, both Wallace and Darwin would enter history as the discoverers of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Yet since the middle of the last century, obstinate publications have surfaced, suggesting that something in this story does not ring true. Darwin had supposedly copied a key idea of his theory, that of divergence, from that letter from Tonati from Wallace. I don't believe this to be the case. To me, they are both heroes, albeit of very different kinds.
During the flight back to Tahiti, I dream of this paradisical island in the middle of the Pacific. I'm looking forward to my reunion with the Clipper and to continue Darwin's voyage. We commenced the longest crossover with the Clipper on our Beagle journey, 3,700 miles across the Pacific Ocean. Darwin was profoundly impressed by the immensity of the Pacific. It is necessary to sail over this great ocean to comprehend its immensity. Moving quickly onwards for weeks together, we meet with nothing but the same blue, profoundly deep ocean. Look, we've been sailing on the vast Pacific Ocean before the trade winds for two and a half weeks now. And yes, it's a peaceful ocean, or has been so far, and it's beautiful. But I'm a bit disappointed. There's no life, nothing. It's spooky, it's eerie. There are no birds, no whales, not even a passing sea lion. But then that's the wrong way to look at it. If you take a section here, say, from the surface down to 30 feet, and the same section in any rainforest in the world, here you will have between three and seven times more life. It's teeming with life here. It's just that it's not life as we know it. It's not familiar at all. It's tiny, but we share the secret of life with every single one of these organisms. And the secret of life is DNA. Darwin finally discovered it on the Galapagos. Life begins as a single form. Every embryo of a human, but also that of a fish, goes through a process of evolution, which implies that all species on Earth have a common ancestor. From a single cell, we develop into a cluster of cells in a very wet environment, and at a certain point, we have gills and a heart and even kidneys that resemble those of a fish. But our fish kidneys gradually disappear, and we develop a set of kidneys that have evolved to enable us to live on land. How full of genuine scientific wonder life is. The vast, incalculable ocean forces us to think. With the Galapagos still fresh in our memory, the conversation is all about how Darwin came up with the greatest idea of all time. I decide to open one of his works of genius again and I find his sketch of the tree of life. There we are, the tree of life. Image is incredibly important in science, as in, as in art, as important as in art, I think. You need something like that. Darwin used the tree of life to visualize his idea that all life on Earth is linked together. And as we now know, it started 4.3 billion years ago. From one form or several, as Darwin put it, all life on Earth has diverged. 
Maar wat er op bepaalde momenten gebeurt is dat sommige van die takken zijn samengegroeid en een nieuw beestje hebben gemaakt. En dat is niet één keer gebeurd. Dat is zeker twee keer gebeurd. Totdat er een cel was, wat, de cel, wat een cel is die de voorouder is van al het leven op, op aarde. Wat op een gegeven moment duidelijk werd, is dat, dat bepaalde delen in onze cellen veel meer lijken op bacteriën dan op, op de rest van onze cellen. Henk is a specialist in DNA, a carrier of all our hereditary traits. Man, you shouldn't do science on a moving ship. <laughs> no wonder my lab is on land. We're going surprisingly fast. Yeah, and it moves. You're going to lose your bucket. Uh, yeah, it's on a rope, luckily. There. There. Well, where's my food? A bucket of water from the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to do is filter out zooplankton. The, little, the animals, little animals. Yeah, not, little animals that, that live not the plants. that live in the ocean. Mm. And what I'll try to show is that these animals, although they don't look at all like us, that these are made of the same building blocks as, as you and me. Yeah. And that is very new information that, that Darwin never had access to, of course, because this is all from the last 50 years. Is the DNA in every cell, every single? DNA is in every single cell of every single organism in this world. Wow. Not only all animals, but also all plants and all bacteria. And even bacteria and humans share a common ancestor. And the same is true of plants? The same is true of plants and fungi and... Everything? Everything. We'll see how we can't. Well, you see there's some seaweed in there. But these little dots you see in there, yeah, I can see things. Um, all these little dots, they're all little planktonic animals. Ja, en voorzichtig, want uh, daar komen krachten in. Dus hij wil gaan draaien uit de cel. Oké, okay. round up! How does this show that uh, we have common ancestry? What you can see under here is a, is a chicken embryo. A chicken embryo? Yeah, and, and so a chicken embryo, a chicken is an animal that looks a lot like you and me. Yeah, well. So that's, that's why, I, why I took it. And I stained for, uh, for a protein, so one of these building blocks of life, and the name of the protein is engrilled. And so what you see is, um, you see the head of the embryo. Something like a little tiny hammerhead shark. You like a little hammerhead shark, yeah. So these bulges, the, the hammerheads, is, are, the, are the bulges of the forebrain. Blimey. And then towards you is the midbrain and the hindbrain. If you look carefully, you see that, that area around the hindbrain that the, the brown stain is a little bit darker. Yes. And that, that's where the signal is, and that's where the engrill protein is normally expressed. Now, the real cool part, of course, is that these are random animals that we fished out of the ocean before. Mm -hmm. And um, I stained those two. And I don't know exactly what they are. And I did exactly the same staining on it for the same protein. And, and you see signal. Beautiful. Very, very different from you and me. Nevertheless, made from the same building blocks. So in a way, when the romantics said they felt at one with nature, they didn't know it, but they were. Yeah, not only that, but sort of this whole idea that um, that in each cell of you there's a piece of DNA that has been in some organism for more than four billion years. Yeah. That, that is the, the thing that um, connects all life on this, on this world. If there's something immortal, yeah. it's that strand of DNA that keeps moving from one to the next um, organism.
The intense competition between male birds of paradise for the females has produced the most beautiful plumage on earth. Or to put it another way, the intense selection pressure of female choice has produced males that are stunning to look at. The paradise produced by competition is Darwin's theory of evolution by sexual selection, which Wallace denied for the rest of his life. So we are given a little bit of paradise as an incidental byproduct of the rigorous process of sexual selection. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If so, you can watch the next episode here. Or check another recommended series on our channel. And don't forget to subscribe to get updates on new series.